Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to lecture 23 of the course on econometric methods for statisticians, data scientists and data engineers. The title of this lecture is models with dummy explanatory variables and models with discrete dependent variables. Now, in many applications apart from usual uh, quantitative variables, uh, one can also have several qualitative variables or some unusual variables as the predictors. For example, suppose uh, someone is interested in developing a model for the rainfall data. Then the possible predictor variables for the model are say temperature, atmospheric temperature, atmospheric humidity, etcetera. Now, apart from these variables which one can measure accurately or which are quantitative measures, one can also have different seasons as one of the predictor variable. Say you divide the entire year into four quarters, then different quarters may be your predictor variables for rainfall data. Then the problem is how to accommodate different quarters in your model. Then uh, apart from predictor variables, sometimes even your dependent variable is a quantitative variable or it is a discrete dependent variable. For example, whether a person owns a house or not. Now, the person owns a house or not, it depends upon his income or it may depend upon several other variables. But here, even y is a qualitative variable or whether in a particular week a person is employed or not. So, again this dependent variable y whether the person is employed or not, this is a discrete or qualitative variable. So, again the problem is can we use uh, the usual linear regression model to model such kind of dependent variables or we require some alternative models, some alternative procedures for modeling such kind of dependent variables. So, in this lecture and again in the next lecture, we are going to discuss such kind of issues. Now, we define dummy variable. Dummy variable is defined for some unusual variables like seasonal variables or qualitative variables and usually it takes value 1 or 0 to indicate the absence or presence of some categorical effect or qualitative characteristic. For example, we consider the seasonal dummies and your dependent variable y is the rainfall and then we have quarterly data on rainfall. Then apart from other variables like humidity, atmospheric temperature etcetera, rainfall also depends upon different quarters. Say in North India, you find more rainfall in the month of say July, August or September say. 
So, in the third quarter, you really then find rainfall in the second quarter. So, the rainfall depends upon different quarters also. The problem is how to accommodate different quarters in the model. So, we define different dummy variables for different quarters. So, for i equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, we define a quarterly dummy variable as follows. Say q i t is equal to 1 if the t th observation is from i th quarter and 0 otherwise. Say for 4 quarters, you have 4 quarters say q 1, q 2, q 3, q 4. Now, suppose some observation is from q 1, the first quarter. If the observation is from the first quarter, then you take q 1 equal to 1, q 2 equal to 0, q 3 equal to 0 and q 4 equal to 0. If the observation is from the second quarter, you take q 1 equal to 0, q 2 equal to 1, q 3 equal to 0, q 4 equal to 0. If the observation is from the third quarter, we take q 1 and q 2 equal to 0, q 3 equal to 1, again q 4 equal to 0. And if the observation is from the fourth quarter, then we take q 1, q 2, q 3 equal to 0 and q 4 equal to 1. So, to accommodate these four quarters, we define these four dummy variables q 1, q 2, q 3, q 4. Now, suppose x t is the vector of other explanatory variables at time t. Then you may write the model as y t equal to alpha 1 q 1 t plus alpha 2 q 2 t plus alpha 3 q 3 t plus alpha 4 q 4 t plus x t transpose beta plus u t. So, this is how you can accommodate four quarters in your model. But remember one thing, when you take x t, make sure that x t should not contain a column of 1s, means this term should not contain an interceptor, because if it has a column of 1, it has an interceptor, then q 1 t plus q 2 t plus q 3 t plus q 4 t is equal to 1. The observation is either from the first quarter or from the second quarter or from the third quarter or from the fourth quarter. So, one of these q i t's is equal to 1 and all other q i t's are equal to 0. So, if you take sum of all these q i t is a q 1 t, q 2 t, q 3 t, q 4 t, then you get 1. And if this x t has an intercept term, then this implies that the data matrix is perfectly collinear. If you add first four columns, then you get the intercept term column. So, you get the case of perfect multicollinearity. So, if we uh, define uh, different dummy variables like this. Say we incorporate q1, q2, q3, q4 in our model, then we should not include the intercept term here in x3. In fact, if you look at the model, it has four intercept terms corresponding to four seasons, or you can say that for the first quarter the mean level, the intercept term is alpha 1. The, for the second quarter, intercept term is alpha 2. So, the mean level of the model for the first quarter is different from the mean level of the model for the second quarter. Then, for the third quarter, the intercept term is alpha 3. So, the mean level of the third quarter is also different and so on. So, the intercept term corresponding to four seasons are different alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 and alpha 4. And it makes sense also, because the mean level of rainfall 
for the third quarter which is consist of July, August and September should be higher than the mean level of rainfall for the second quarter which is consist of April, May and June. Then you have one alternative formulation also you can write the model as y t equal to alpha 1. So, we have incorporated an intercept term here then we take gamma 2 q 2 t plus gamma 3 q 3 t plus gamma 4 q 4 t plus x t transpose beta plus u t. So, in fact, uh, this model does not contain one of the quarters or the dummy variable corresponding to one of the quarters that is the first quarter. In fact, uh, you can write say suppose you write gamma 2 equal to alpha 2 minus alpha 1 and gamma 3 equal to alpha 3 minus alpha 1 gamma 4 equal to alpha 4 minus alpha 1. So, you can write the previous model as alpha 1 q 1 t plus q 2 t plus q 3 t plus q 4 t plus you have alpha 1 q 2 t here. So, you take alpha 2 minus alpha 1 q 2 t plus then alpha 3 minus alpha 1 q 3 t plus alpha 4 minus alpha 1 q 4 t. We are leaving the other terms. So, we can write this part of the model in this form and then this is equal to alpha 1 then q 1 t plus q 2 t plus q 3 t plus q 4 t is equal to 1 and then we are writing alpha 2 minus alpha 1 equal to gamma 2. So, you get gamma 2 q 2 t plus gamma 3 q 3 t plus gamma 4 q 4 t. So, either we take the previous formulation or we take this formulation. This formulation has the intercept term, but then this formulation does not have q 1 t. Then one may also be interested in the hypothesis of the form h alpha 1 equal to alpha 2 equal to alpha 3 equal to alpha 4 equal to 0 or this hypothesis is equivalent to saying that gamma 2 equal to gamma 3 equal to gamma 4 equal to 0 for this model. Now, if you are using the previous formulation then you test this hypothesis, if you are using this formulation then you test this hypothesis and uh, these hypothesis mean the effect of four quarters are the same and uh, you can use the set of linear hypothesis of the form r beta equal to small r to test these hypotheses. Then uh, sometimes you have qualitative variables as your predictor variables like education level, caste, sex etcetera. Again we may represent these variables as dummy variables. So, for example, income of a person is modeled as a function of caste, sex, education level, age etcetera. Now, suppose we consider three caste groups. The first is general category and we denote it by dummy variable C 1. Then we have OBC category which is denoted by C 2 and SCST denoted by C 3. And then we define the dummy variables C 1, C 2, C 3 as C 1 equal to 1 if the person belongs to the general category and 0 otherwise, C, t, C 2 equal to 1 if the person belongs to OBC category and 0 otherwise and C 3 is equal to 1 if the person belongs to SCST category and 0 otherwise. So, corresponding to cast we define three dummy variables as per three 
groups or three categories. Similarly, you may define the dummy variables corresponding to sex same male and female. You define actually two dummy variables S1 and S2. So, S1 equal to 1 or 0 according as a person is male or not or S2 is equal to 1 or 0 according as a person is female or not. Then suppose literacy level has four categories say first is illiterate, second below graduation, third graduation and fourth above graduation. So, we have defined four categories for literacy level. So, we define four dummy variables say E 1, E 2, E 3, E 4 corresponding to each category. Now, in case of one dummy variable, we do not include the constant term or if we include the constant term, we drop one of the dummy variable. So, in this example, if you consider this formulation, then we do not include the constant term or the intercept term. And if we consider this formulation, we are including the constant term or the intercept term, but then we have dropped q 1 t. So, we have dropped one of the dummy variables. Otherwise, you will have collinearity. Now, for two dummy variables, say sum of first set minus the sum of second set is also 0. So, S 1 plus S 2 is equal to 1. So, either S 1 is equal to 1 or S 2 is equal to 1. If S 1 is 1, S 2 is 0. If S 1 is 0, S 2 is 1. So, their sum is equal to 1. Then C 1 plus C 2 plus C 3 is also equal to 1. So, if you take the difference C 1, S 1 plus S 2 minus C 1 plus C 2 plus C 3, then you get 0. So, the sum of first set minus the sum of second set is 0. So, even if you drop the intercept term, if you have two dummy variables in your model and uh, you are including both S 1, S 2 and C 1, C 2, C 3, you will have the problem of collinearity. So, either we drop the constant term and one of the dummy variables from one set or we retain the constant term and drop one of the dummy variables from each set. Say you are dropping the constant term, then you drop one of the dummy variables from one set. Means, uh, if you have one dummy variable and if you drop the constant term, then you retain both the dummy variables, but here you have to drop one of the dummy variables even if you drop the constant term. So, either you drop S 1 or S 2 or C 1 or C 2 or C 3. So, either you drop one of the dummy variables from this group or from the, this group. And uh, another rule is you retain the constant term and drop one of the dummy variables from each set. So, you retain the constant term and then say you drop S 1 and C 1 or you drop S 2 and C 2 or you drop S 2 and C 3. So, it depends upon you. Uh, it does not make any difference whether you follow this rule or this rule so far as model is concerned. So, it depends upon your choice, your convenience. Then this rule also appears for three or more dummy variables. So, the best rule uh, which you can apply is you retain the constant term and then you drop one of the dummy variables from each set whether you have three dummy variables or four dummy variables etcetera. So, if you have two dummy variables sex and category, then uh, suppose we do not have the constant term, then we take say uh, both S 1 and S 2, but we drop C 3 or if we retain the constant term, then we drop S 2 from here and C 3 from here. So, you can follow any of these tools or you can even drop uh, uh, S 1 from here and then you retain S 2 or C 1 from here and then you retain C 3 and C 2. Now, we consider the earning equation 
y equal to beta naught plus beta 1 s 1 plus beta 2 x plus 0. So, for s 1 equal to 1 means for females your intercept term is beta naught plus beta 1 and for males the intercept term is beta naught. So, the on, uh, intercept term shifts from males to females. Then the returns to an extra year of education beta 2 is assumed to be the same for males as well as females. So, what is the role of beta 2? If x varies from x to x plus 1, then y varies from y to y plus beta 2 and this holds for both male as well as for females. So, an extra year of education has similar effect on males as well as females. Now, if we introduce the interaction variable say female into education equal to s 1 into x, then your regression becomes y equal to beta naught plus beta 1 s 1 plus beta 2 x plus gamma s 1 into x plus u. Now, what happens for s 1 equal to 1? For s 1 equal to 1, your model is y equal to beta naught plus beta 1 plus beta 2 x plus gamma x. So, your intercept term is beta naught plus beta 1 and slope coefficient is beta 2 plus gamma for females. Whereas, for males the intercept term is beta naught and the slope coefficient is beta 2. So, this interaction variable s 1 into x is equal to x if individual is female and it is 0 if the individual is male and returns to an extra year of education. So, del y over del x is beta 2 plus gamma into s 1. So, it is actually equal to beta 2 for the male and beta 2 plus gamma for a female. So, if you introduce such kind of interaction variable, then it shifts the slope coefficient also beta 2 and beta 2 plus gamma. For males it is beta 2, for females it is beta 2 plus gamma. So, estimating earning equation 2 is equivalent to estimating two earning equations, one for males and another one for females separately. So, now you have two different earning equations, one for males and another one for females. Then equation 2 imposes the same variance across the two groups for males as well as for females, the variance remains the same. Whereas, separate regressions do not impose such condition of equality of variances. So, this is the difference. If you are running two regressions separately, one for males and one for females, then normally we assume different variances also for the two regressions. But here you are assuming the same variance for the two regressions. And then we can test the equality of two slopes using f tests. So, you can apply F test for testing whether both males and females have the same slope coefficients or not. Means, whether the models for males and females have same slope coefficients or not. Now, we consider the case when you have discrete and limited dependent variables. We first consider the case when you have dichotomous binary or dummy variables as the dependent variable. So, we define dichotomous binary or dummy variables. These variables take on a value 1 or 0 depending upon which of two possible results occur. For example, suppose y i star is the tolerance of an insect to a particular insecticide. Now, this tolerance is unobservable. 
So, y i star is unobservable. So, you may replace it by a dummy variable. So, you define y i equal to 1 if the insect dies and 0 otherwise. So, instead of tolerance of the insect, we are measuring y i. So, y i is the dummy variable for the tolerance. Then suppose y i is equal to 1 if the ith person is employed in a week and 0 otherwise. Again y i is a dichotomous variable. It takes values 1 or 0 and sometimes your variable may be classified into more than two categories. So, such kind of variables are called polychotomous variables. So, y i is equal to 1 if i th person is in poor health, 2 if i th person is in fair health and 3 if i th person is in excellent health. Of course, you can change these values also you can define y i equal to 0 if i th person is in poor health, you may take y i equal to 1 if i th person is in fair health and 2 if i th person is in excellent health. Now, we consider modeling of dichotomous variables. Now, approaches for modeling such kind of variables are linear probability model, log it model or probit model. So, presently we are considering these three approaches. First actually in this lecture, I have considered the case when you have just one explanatory variable x i. Then in the next lecture, we will consider the case when you have more than one explanatory variables that is we will consider the general case. But uh, here just to explain these models in a simple way. I have taken this simple model. So, first we consider the linear probability model. We consider the model y i equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 x i plus u i i equal to 1 to n, where y i is equal to 1 if an insect dies and 0 otherwise and x i is the amount of insecticide used. So, we write y i as a linear function of x i. So, model 1 expresses a dichotomous dependent variable y as a linear function of the explanatory variable x i. Such kind of models are called linear probability model. Why these models are called probability models? This I will explain you later, but uh, why the model is called linear? Because y i is a linear function of x i. Now, expectation of u i is equal to 0 for all i, we take this assumption. So, then expectation of y i given x i is equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 x i. Then suppose p i is the probability that y i equal to 1, that is p i is the probability that the i th insect dies. Of course, y i is a function of x i. So, this probability also depends upon the amount of insecticide used. Then uh, 1 minus p i is the probability that y i equal to 0, that is the insect survives. The insect survives at the x i dose of insecticide. Then expected value of y i is equal to, of course, y i takes value 1 with probability p i. So, expectation of y i is equal to 1 into p i plus it takes value 0 in with probability 1 minus p i. In fact, y i is a Bernoulli random variable takes value 1 with probability p i and 0 with probability 1 minus p i. So, then expected value of y i is p i. So, this gives you p i equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 x i. Now, p i is the probability 
probability that y i equal to 1 and uh, you know that the probability lies between 0 and 1, p i lies between 0 and 1. So, this implies that expectation of y i lies between 0 and 1. Now, we consider the estimation of linear probability model. If you want to apply the OLS, the ordinary least square estimator for estimating beta 1, beta 2, then you face some difficulties. The first one is normal t, u i is equal to y i minus beta 1 minus beta 2 x i. So, u i is equal to if y i is equal to 1, then u i is equal to 1 minus beta 1 minus beta 2 x i if y i is equal to 1 and uh, then u i takes this value with probability p i because p i is the probability with which y i takes value 1. Then u i is equal to minus beta 1 minus beta 2 x i if y i is equal to 0 and y i takes value 0 with probability 1 minus p i. So, u i is also a Bernoulli random variable. It is taking values 1 minus beta 1 minus beta 2 x i with probability p i and minus beta 1 minus beta 2 x i with probability 1 minus p i. So, obviously, it does not follow the normal distribution, but then for applying OLS, the assumption of normality is not required. So, one can say that still you can use the method of least squares for estimating the coefficients, because for applying the method of least squares, you do not require the assumption of normality. Then the second one is heteroscedasticity. Now, suppose the uh, expectation of u i u j is equal to 0 for all i not equal to j, then variance of u i is equal to expectation of u i square and then u i takes value 1 minus beta 1 minus beta 2 x i. So, u i square takes value 1 minus beta 1 minus beta 2 x i square with probability p i plus u i takes value minus beta 1 minus beta 2 x i, then we take a square of this because you have to take expectation of u i square with probability 1 minus p i. Now, 1 minus beta 1 minus beta 2 x i is equal to 1 minus p i and uh, then minus beta 1 minus beta 2 x i is equal to minus p i. So, if we take a square of this, then you get p i square. Actually, we have already shown that p i is equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 x i. So, here you get 1 minus p i and here you get minus p i. So, you get 1 minus p i square p i plus p i square 1 minus p i and then you take p i 1 minus p i common and then you get 1 minus p i first and then you get plus p i. So, you get p i into 1 minus p i or p i is equal to expectation of y i given x i and 1 minus p i is 1 minus expectation y i given x i. Now, this is equal to w i. So, all the u i s have different variances, variance of u i is w i or you can say u i is are heteroscedastic. Then one of the option is we divide both sides of 1 by under root w i. So, that you get y i upon under root w i equal to 1 upon under root w i beta 1 plus beta 2 x i upon under root w i plus u i upon under root w i. Then variance of u i upon under root w i is equal to 1. So, all the u i s have constant variance. So, this kind of transformation removes the problem of heteroscedasticity. So, this model has homoscedastic disturbances. Now, since the expectation of u i upon under root w i square is equal to 1, we can apply OLS to model 4. Further, w i s are unknown. So, to estimate w i s, we adopt the following two step procedure. In step 1, we apply OLS to model 1 and then we obtain the predicted value of y i s say y i head is equal to 
say you estimate beta 1 and beta 2. So, you get say b 1 plus b 2 x i, you obtain more or less estimator of betas and then you get the predicted value of y i as y i hat. Then estimate w i by w i hat equal to y i hat 1 minus y i hat. And at the second step, you transform the data by dividing by under root w i hat and then we run OLS to the transformed data. Then there is one more problem, still we can ad adopt the previously explained procedure for estimating the model, but you cannot ensure that expectation of y i given x i lies between 0 and 1. Actually, we have observed that expectation of y i given x i is equal to p i. So, this is a probability. So, this must lie between 0 and 1, but on the basis of estimated model, you cannot ensure this. Then there is no guarantee that w i had the estimate of expectation of y i given x i lies between 0 and 1. And if y i head does not lie between 0 and 1, then one problem is that it is an estimate of the probability p i. So, p i head is equal to say y i head. So, it must lie between 0 and 1. Secondly, while estimating w i head, you are using y i head into 1 minus y i head. So, if y i head is greater than 1 or if y i head is negative, then this quantity becomes negative, but w i head cannot be negative. w i head is the estimate of variance, so it cannot be negative. So, we may take w y i head equal to 0 if O L S estimate is less than 0 and y i head equal to 1 if O L S estimate is greater than 1. But this is just an ad hoc procedure. So, normally we do not use linear probability model for modeling such kind of dichotomous variables. Now, we consider logit models. So, we take this example suppose x i is the income of i th person and y i is, is equal to 1 if the i th person owns a house and 0 otherwise. Then the logit model for this house ownership example is p i equal to expectation of y i given x i equal to 1 upon 1 plus exponential minus beta 1 plus beta 2 x i. So, here p i is not a linear function of beta 1 plus beta 2 x i, but it is actually this kind of logistic function or you can say p i is equal to 1 upon 1 plus e to the power minus z i where z i is equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 x i. In fact, you can also write p i equal to e to the power z i upon 1 plus z i. So, z i lies between minus infinity to plus infinity and this makes the range of p i from 0 to 1. If z i tends to minus infinity, p i tends to 0. If z i tends to plus infinity, p i tends to 1. So, if we use this kind of model that is logit model, then this logit model ensures that p i lies between 0 and 1, whatever be the values of beta 1, beta 2 and x i r. Further, p i has a non-linear relationship with x i and beta 1, beta 2. So, we cannot directly apply the OLS procedure because you have a non-linear function here. Then 1 minus p i is equal to 1 minus 1 upon 1 plus e to power minus z i which is equal to e to power minus z i upon 1 plus e to the power minus z i. Now, if you take p i upon 1 minus p i, p i is equal to 1 upon 1 plus e to power minus z i upon 1 minus p i is e to power minus z i upon 1 plus e to the power minus z i. So, you get 1 upon e to the power minus z i which is equal to e to the power z i. Now, we write l i equal to log p i upon 1 minus p i. 
this is equal to z i and z i is equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 x i. Then p i upon 1 minus p i, this is called the odds ratio in favor of event that insect dies or the odd ratio in favor of event. If we consider the present example, then the person owns a house. So, you can say this is the person owns a house. Then L i which is equal to log p i upon 1 minus p i is called the log it. Now, we consider probit model and we explain probit model with family house ownership example. So, suppose uh, for the ith family the decision whether the family own a house or not depends upon a utility capital I small i i i and we write i i equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 x i where x i is the income of the family. Then suppose i i star is the critical or threshold level of the utility index for the ith family and uh, this critical or threshold level means if the utility is greater than i i star that is in that case the family own a house and this critical or threshold level is actually unobservable. Now, we assume that i i star follows a normal distribution with the same mean and variance for all i. So, we assume normal t for i i star. Then the probability that y i equal to 1 we denoted by p i is equal to the probability that i i star is less than or equal to i i. The utility to own a house is greater than or equal to the threshold level and for i i star we are assuming a normal distribution and uh, suppose we are assuming a standard normal distribution by for i i star. So, we have the probability means this probability is equal to 1 upon under root 2 pi integral from minus infinity to i i e to power minus t square y 2 d t. And then this is equal to 1 upon under root 2 pi integral from minus infinity to beta 1 plus beta 2 x i. You write the value of i i here and then you have e to power minus t square y 2 d t. And this is equal to f beta 1 plus beta 2 x i, where this capital F denotes the CDF of normal distribution. So, from here i i equal to f inverse p i is equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 x i, where f inverse is the inverse of normal CDF. So, you have this model i i is also called the normal equivalent deviate. Since i i is less than 0 whenever p i is less than 0 0.5, we add 5 to the normal equivalent deviate n e d and get the probit. Just to make or just to ensure that i i remains positive, we add 5 in n e d and then we fit the model. Of course, it does not make any difference, it just changes the value of intercept term. So, we get i i equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 x i plus u i. Then uh, for estimation purpose, we proceed as follows. We estimate p i by p i head equal to n i upon capital N i. Say suppose at income level x i, you have capital N i families and out of those capital I and I families, small n i families own a house. Then we estimate p i y small n i upon capital N i. Then we obtain f inverse p i hat using the normal table that is i i hat. Then using i i hat all sometimes if you want then you may convert them into probits just by adding 5 and then we use probit as the dependent variable. And then we apply GLS to estimate 
beta 1 and beta 2. So, in this model we apply GLS, we replace i i by its estimate i i head or by probit and then we estimate this model by using GLS. Now, here actually you have two options, either you use N E D or estimate or estimates of N E Ds for fitting the model or you use the probits which are obtained by adding 5 to N E Ds, but it does not make any difference. So, we observe that the slope coefficient beta 2 and r square will remain the same whether we use NED or probit. In fact, uh, you might remember the result that the slope coefficient, the regression coefficient beta 2 or r square, the square of correlation coefficient here, here you have just one variable. So, r square is just the square of correlation coefficient are unaffected by the change of origin. So, whether you are using i i head or i i head plus 5, these two will remain the same. The only difference is in the estimate of intercept term. So, this will change. So, it just depends upon your convenience. The only advantage with probit is that it ensures that your dependent variable becomes positive. So, in this lecture we have considered the case when your explanatory variables or dependent variables are qualitative variables or some unusual variables. These are not the usual quantitative variables. First, we consider the case when uh, our explanatory variable is a qualitative variable like some seasonal variable or it may be the level of education, it may be sex. So, the problem is how to accommodate such kind of qualitative variables in your model. So, we define some dummy variables and uh, using those dummy variables, we can accommodate these uh, qualitative variables in our model. Then there is a rule in incorporating those dummy variables in your model. Say suppose you have one dummy variable, then either you do not include the intercept term in your model or if you include the intercept term in your model, then you just drop one of the dummy variables. Say suppose you have quarterly data and you have defined dummy variable for corresponding to each quarter, then either you do not involve the intercept term in your model or if you are involving the intercept term in your model, then you drop one of the dummy variables corresponding to either first quarter or second quarter or third quarter or fourth quarter. Similar kind of rule we follow if you have more than one say two or three qualitative variables in your model. So, uh, we have also considered the case when our dependent variable is some qualitative variable like uh, whether the person owns a house or not or whether the person owns a car or not or uh, for the particular dose of insecticide whether an insect dies or not. So, for modeling such kind of dependent variables, if we use the usual linear probability model, then it often fails to provide a proper model. So, usually we use uh, some different kind of approach, say we use log it model or probit model. These models log it or probit models ensure that your uh, predicted or estimated values of probability is probability that insect dies or it survives, 
such kind of probabilities, estimates of such kind of probabilities remain within the interval 0 to 1. In the next lecture, we will consider the general case of log it and prob it models when the model has more than one explanatory variables. So, I am going to stop here. Thank you. Hi, I am Chitwan Lalji, a PhD student of Health Economics under the supervision of Dr. Debayan Pakrashi uh, from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Kanpur. In one of my essays, I am interested in understanding the relationship between consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators. Health indicators, both subjective and objective health indicators like mental health, self-assessed health, various measures of blood pressure and various measures of cholesterol. Uh, measures of blood pressure like systolic and diastolic BP, you have your incidence of high BP, MAP and incidence of high MAP. And as far as cholesterol is concerned, I have tried to concentrate more on total cholesterol, good cholesterol and incidence of high cholesterol. Now before I go on to what have been my major contributions and various policy implications, I would like to briefly tell you about the policy initiatives of WHO and various countries. The WHO that is the World Health Organization, it started with a campaign of 5 a day. That is you should have 5 portions of fruits and vegetables per day. That would be approximately you could say 400 grams of fruits and vegetables. Now a portion, before we go further, I will just tell you what exactly is a portion. One portion is equivalent to a medium sized apple or one small glass of fruit juice which is approximately 150 milliliters and uh, maybe 3 teaspoons of vegetables. So, uh, the WHO went with a 5 a day campaign which was further taken up by various countries. Countries like UK, Netherlands, Germany, Norway, they adopted the 5 a day policy while some went for expansionary dietary policies like France, Australia, Canada, Denmark. So, for example, Australia, it went for go for 2 plus 5 policy in which it said that you should consume five por 2 portions of fruits and 5 portions of vegetables per day. And USA went for a policy of fruits and vegetables more matters. That is, you must consume more and more fruits and vegetables. Now, irrespective of these expansionary dietary policies and dietary propagations, it has been found that only 28 percent of women and 25 percent of men they actually meet the recommended dietary norms of five a, po five a day portion. So, the major contribution of my work is firstly to find an association between fruits and vegetables, whether there exists a relationship between fruits and vegetables and health indicators and if they exist, whether if due to heterogeneity in the data, so I will be doing it according to age, by gender and by uh, your weight. So, apart from that, I will go for policy recommendations in which I will, I am basically studying uh, how much fruits and vegetables matter, apart from that, which type matters more. So, for that, I have taken data from the Health Survey of England. Health Survey of England is an annual survey which takes uh, data, which con conducts information regularly on demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. You have your lifestyle behaviors like an individual smokes or does not smoke, alcohol consumption, you have your sedentary and physical activities and you have various health uh, indicators also which have been collected. Uh, so, uh, before I go on to what exactly is my research, I would like to concentrate more on fruits and vegetables like what kind of questions were asked in the survey. Questions like what kind of fresh fruit do you eat? Did you eat any dried fruit yesterday? Do not count dried fruits in cereals, cakes. Apart from that, for vegetables, they asked how many tablespoons of vegetables did you eat yesterday? So, approximately after this whole survey was conducted, data was converted into portions of fruits and uh, like for example, three, por three tablespoons of vegetables is equivalent to one portion. So, data was converted and provided to the users that is us. 
from the UK Data Health Survey. So the major con contributions of my paper is that I found a strong negative association between uh, intake of fruits and self-assessed health, then various measures of uh, blood pressure like mean arterial pressure, high mean arterial pressure, high blood pressure, systolic and diastolic BP and your total cholesterol. Apart from that, I have found a strong positive association between consumption of vegetables and good cholesterol. So, it is recommended in a way that if you want to control your blood pressure, you must consume more and more fruits. And as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact your good cholesterol. Apart from that, I went in for a falsification test. A falsification test is basically conducted to know whether the model that you have adopted and the conclusions that you are drawing are not spurious. So, if uh, a falsification test is done to know, in a way it is tested by seeing an indicator, a health indicator which is not being impacted by your consumption of fruits and vegetables. And then see, we see whether there is significant result or not. If there is no significant result, that means your model is good and your results are non-spurious. So what we did is for falsification test, we took ear complaints and infectious diseases. Now ear complaints like if you are deaf since birth or you have some kind of imbalance body imbalance that is not being impacted by your post consumption of fruits and vegetables and we did find insignificant results. Apart from that infectious diseases like HIV, A, HIV AIDS etc we found similar insignificant results indicating that our, uh, that our results are not spurious, non spurious. Apart from that we went uh, since there was a, a lot of heterogeneity in the data like uh, by gender, by age and by weight. We, can, we did the regression analysis. We found results which stated that as far as uh, fruits are concerned, it impacts a male's health more than a female's health. So it is basically said a, a man should consume more fruits to impact his health whereas as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact a women's health more. But this has been only seen as far as cholesterol is concerned, the various measures of cholesterol like total cholesterol, good cholesterol and your incidence of getting high cholesterol. Now after this we went in for a policy implication and in the policy implication we found, we tried to find two policy implications, what matters and exactly how much portion matters. So as far as how much portion matters, we have found that on an average, five or more portions of fruits impact your overall health, that is your self-assessed health, your MAP, your incidence of high MAP and incidence of high BP. But if you want to have a good mental health, so you can optimize your mental health by consuming three or four portions of fruits as well. And similarly, has, uh, as far as self-assessed health and total cholesterol is concerned, an individual must consume four to five portions to optimally have the impact of consumption of fruits. Apart from that, vegetables have had a very little impact on your health. It only impacts your incidence of getting high MAP and high BP and uh, you, it's seen that only it impacts when you consume five or more portions of fruits. So an optimum consumption of five or more portions of fruits and vegetables are recommended but fruits have a more impact on your overall health, on various measures like self-assessed health, mental health, your various measures of blood pressure and various cholesterol levels. Another thing that we find is which type of fruit matters. It has been seen that all size fruits, they impact your self-assessed health, your systolic and diastolic blood pressure, your mean arterial pressure, your high BP and incidence of getting high MAP and high cholesterol. But we find that uh, as far as frozen fruits or canned fruits are concerned, they have a, they help in regulating your incidence of getting high MAP or high BP, but it has a trade-off that means there is something negative happening, it reduces the good cholesterol in your body. Apart from this, it, if, you ha if you have an incidence of getting high cholesterol, it is recommended that you must consume fruit juices because it has a si impact in reducing your probability of getting high cholesterol. And uh, dried fruits, they impact your self-assessed health. As far as vegetables are concerned, very little impact has been seen. It has only been seen in case of uh, uh, portion of salads and its association with self-assessed health. Another thing that they have seen is vegetables in composite, they have an association with good cholesterol. So overall, my research basically says that there is an association between 
consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators and um, it is highly recommended that an individual in order to be healthy must consume five or more portions of fruits and five or more portions of vegetables per day but fruits have a more impact on your overall health apart from that all size fruits they have a better impact on your overall health your mental health various measures of blood pressure and cholesterol so thank you